Hi everyone, this is a lesson number one of the course Point of Care Ultrasound and Undifferentiated Shock. During this course, I will talk about the use of point of care ultrasound and diagnosis and monitoring of undifferentiated shock patients. Point of care ultrasound, or POCUS for short, is an invaluable diagnostic tool that I have been using for a very long time during my career in emergency and critical care medicine. It becomes more and more popular in human critical care as well as in veterinary medicine. The RUSH exam, or Rapid Ultrasound and Shock, was first described in 2009. It involves a three-part bedside physiologic assessment, simplified as the pump, the tank, and the pipes. The evaluation of the pump allows a clinician to assess cardiac function and rule out pericardial effusion. The evaluation of the tank helps a clinician to assess the volume status. And finally, the pipes portion of the exam is a little bit less applicable to our population of patients because the main goal in human medicine is to detect deep vein thrombosis in lower extremities, which rarely occurs in dogs and cats. The first step in evaluation of the patient in shock is determination of cardiac status, termed for the simplicity, the pump. First, the pericardial sac should be visualized to determine if the patient has a pericardial effusion, which may be the cause of symptoms. If a pericardial effusion is identified, the next step is to evaluate the heart for signs of tamponade. We will discuss those signs during this lesson. Next step is the assessment of the left ventricular global contractility. This assessment will allow a rapid determination of the strength of the pump, which can be critical in guiding fluid resuscitation. The eyeball method should be primarily used by emergency physicians as opposed to the measurement performed by cardiologists. Later during this module, I will explain you how you can use an eyeball method, which is more objective than you would think, and also we will talk about a few measurements that may be helpful in certain situations. Based on this assessment, a patient's LV contractility can be broadly categorized as being normal, hyperdynamic, mildly to moderately decreased, or severely decreased. The third step in the assessment of the heart focuses on the evaluation of right heart strain. Any condition that causes a sudden pressure increase within the pulmonary vascular circuit will result in acute dilation of the right side of the heart. Right ventricular enlargement, septal displacement towards the LV lumen, and some other findings that we will discuss during this module may indicate the presence of RV strain. The majority of the standard echocardiographic views can be used in rapid ultrasound and shock assessment. Mastering the acquisition of all of these views will provide you with the most powerful tools to assess the pump portion of the exam. However, limited examination of the heart by using, by using only some of these views may still be helpful. Imaging of the heart usually involves four classical views. The right peristernal long and short axis at the level of papillary muscles, subsophoid view, and the left apical view. First recommended step is the evaluation of the pump to exclude the presence of pericardial effusion. Identification of pericardial effusion may be an easy task. It is important to differentiate between pericardial and pleural effusion. Also, you want to note the amount and echogenicity of the effusion. For example, it is rare when small amount of pericardial effusion is causing cardiac tamponade. However, it is possible in an acute situation when pericardial sac is stiff and non-compliant. Highly echogenic effusion may indicate acute hemorrhage or clotted blood that may happen in animals with ruptured left atrium. The next most important goal is to decide if pericardial effusion is causing a cardiac tamponade physiology or not. Cardiac tamponade physiology occurs when the pressure within the pericardial sac is higher than pressure within one or more of the cardiac chambers, resulting in impaired diastolic filling of this chamber. Classically, right atrium is compromised first, however, it may be different in patients with heart defects or severe pulmonary hypertension. It is vital to remember that cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that echo may be suggestive of tamponade, but the final diagnosis requires the evaluation of the whole clinical picture. 
For example, imagine you're presented with a patient in shock who has mild to moderate amount of pericardial effusion. Since you cannot identify any other causes of shock, you decide to perform pericardial synthesis despite its only mild to moderate amount. If this patient's shock resolves after you drain the pericardium, this will allow you to make a diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. Echocardiographic signs of cardiac tamponade may include diastolic collapse or serpentine deflection of the right atrial wall during diastole when the tricuspid valve is open. As the pericardial pressure continues to rise, the right atrial, left atrial, and left ventricular walls may get collapsed as well. It is common to find a di dilated, non-compliant caudal vena cava in patients with cardiac tamponade due to the presence of very high right atrial pressure. Typically, the majority of the patients will have moderate to severe amount of pericardial effusion if the cardiac tamponade is present. This patient has both pleural and pericardial effusions. However, pleural effusion predominates and only a small amount of pericardial effusion is present. To differentiate between the two, it is important to identify the bright echogenic pericardial sac that usually has a circular shape surrounding the heart. This is a right parasternal long axis view of the heart. There is moderate to large amount of pericardial effusion that is surrounded by hyperechoic bright structure representing a pericardial sac. Free right atrial wall is partially collapsed, suggestive of the true cardiac tamponade physiology. This is a very similar image, however, you may appreciate a complete collapse of the atrial wall and partial collapse of the free right ventricular wall consistent with severe cardiac tamponade. There is also pleural effusion present. This is a left apical four-chamber view. There is moderate to large amount of pericardial effusion resulting in partial right atrial and right ventricular wall collapse. Any ideas what's going on here? This is a sub view. The top of the screen represents a portion of the liver that is separated by a thick hyperechoic bright line, which is the summation of the diaphragm and pericardial sac. Next, there is a thick layer of the hyperechoic pericardial effusion. This patient has a hemopericardium, and its pericardial space is occupied by clotted blood. The most common cause of true acute hemopericardium in veterinary medicine is the left atrial rupture in patients with severe mitral valve disease. Other causes include trauma, neoplasia, and anticoagulant toxicity. However, the blood in the pericardium doesn't clot in case of ardenticide toxicity.